Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening. To begin tonight's program, please welcome to the stage the president and CEO of the National World War II Museum, Stephen Watson. Well, good evening. It is uh, wonderful to see a packed house here uh, tonight for what is going to be a, a very special evening. And it's my pleasure to welcome you as we open the Malcolm S. Forbes Rare and Iconic Artifacts Gallery and Voices from the Front, made possible through the generous support of Margie and Sandy Villery. Yes. And I'll have more to say about that in a moment. So uh, we're just delighted that joining us tonight to mark this important occasion are members of Mr. Forbes's family, including his son, Tim, who is a former member of the Board of Trustees here at the National World War II Museum. And of course, museum trustee currently, Sandy Villery, and members of his family. So let's give them our first round of applause tonight. So as we begin our program here at the museum, we're gonna continue uh, our tradition, and that is to honor all of the World War II veterans Holocaust survivors, and home front workers that are with us here this evening. And I want to give you a very special introduction of 12 members of the greatest generation who are here tonight, whose artifacts or oral histories are in the exhibit that you will get a chance to view after tonight's program. So you do not need to hold your applause. You can applaud as much as you want between introductions. Um, First up is Ambassador Theodore R. Britton, Jr. Welcome, sir. Yeah. Grace Janota Brown. Grace. And we have a, thank you, Grace. And we have a very special couple with us tonight, Margaret Carey Bokey, attending with her husband, World War II veteran, Bob Bokey. That is a magnificent story, by the way, folks, so uh, Google it. Um, Tolly Fletcher. George Hardy, where are you, Colonel? Thank you, sir. Our museum trustee, past chairman, Mr. Paul Hilliard. <laughs> John Lucky Luckadoo. So we had a little bit of a competition going on earlier as to who was the oldest, but I know John just turned 102 on Saturday, so happy belated birthday. But you're not the oldest, John. I think you're the third oldest. And it's rare that Mr. Hilliard can say he's the youngest, so uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, Daniel Lueno. Thank you. Benny Malin. Where's Benny? Thank you, Benny. Olin Pickens. Also 102. Yeah. 102 in two months. Sorry, Lucky. And someone who was here with us earlier, a dear, dear friend of our museum who has been a volunteer since the beginning, but uh, decided he was going to go home, was a little tired, but let's give Mr. Bob Wolf a round of applause as well. 
So one more big round of applause for all of our World War II veterans. Thank you. And uh, I also want to thank a great partner of the museums, the Gary Sinise Foundation, who helped us with the travel arrangements for all of the World War II veterans that are here today. So please give Gary and his team a, a round of applause and thanks. And I also want to acknowledge families of three veterans that are featured in the Voices from the Front Interactive who are no longer with us. And that is the family of Medal of Honor recipient Herschel Woody Williams. I know Chad and Brent and other members of the family are here, so thank you. The family of Vincent Speranza, thank you for being here. And the family of Florence Smith, thank you to being here too. Thank you. And, of course, another part of our tradition is to acknowledge all of those who have served in our military during other conflicts in peacetime. So please stand or wave to be recognized for your service to our country. Thank you. So we are so privileged here at the museum to have such an amazing network of supporters, um, many of you uh, in this room tonight, all of you in this room tonight. Uh, I want to thank our Board of Trustee members who are here. Thank you for your leadership and service to the museum, our Patriot Circle members, our Capital Campaign donors, our program supporters, our charter members. Thank you to all of you who have made this great museum possible. We appreciate it and you make tonight possible. Okay, so I started by mentioning uh, that this evening in this gallery are possible thanks to the incredible generosity of Timothy Forbes and the Forbes family. So just a little bit about the Forbes family. So Malcolm Forbes, uh, Tim's father, enlisted in the Army in 1942, and he served as a machine gunner with the 334th Infantry Regiment, 84th Infantry Division in Europe rising to the rank of staff sergeant. And tonight, when you go into the gallery, you will see his war-weathered field jacket, along with his purple heart, bronze star, and other awards proudly displayed at the entrance to the gallery. And we are honored to display these pieces of his wartime service. But the donation of these artifacts and his support of this gallery are really just the latest step in a long journey and a long partnership with Tim and many members of the Forbes family that go back to a long, long time ago, even a little bit longer than I realized until I spoke to my predecessor today. So I wanna just tell you a little bit about this. Um, and I wanna take a minute to acknowledge my predecessor, our founding president, CEO, co-founder with Dr. Ambrose, Nick Mueller. Nick, please stand, take a bow. So, you know, we all sit here tonight and we look at all of this and some may think it was easy. Uh, well, Nick will tell you it wasn't. And you'll be able to read his book next year that'll tell you all about that. Um, but Nick told me today that the relationship with the Forbes family goes back to 1985. 1985 when the Eisenhower Center uh, for American Studies, which was in a building behind this Louisiana Memorial Pavilion where Dr. Ambrose uh, led a research center, hosted conferences and symposia. And it was back in 1985 when Tim's brother Steve made a gift to support one of those very early conferences in 1985. And that really, I think, sparked uh, an enduring partnership with the Forbes family um, the first million dollar gift to our museum was made in 1998 to first dedicate the gallery and the theater space that you will see reimagined tonight. Uh, and in the early years of this museum, if you came and visited the D-Day Museum, the National D-Day Museum, you probably remember in the Forbes Theater, we had two films 
Christ for Peace, and D-Day Remembered that were a staple of the visitor experience for many, many years. So thank you, Tim. Thank you to the Forbes family for being with us on this journey, for being early believers and two crazy history professors that wanted to do something important for uh, this country. So let's give one more round of applause to Tim and the family. And thank you, Nick, as well. So those of you who have visited the museum as we have opened this wonderful campus and built these exhibits know that many of our exhibits have a signature style. They offer rich, immersive experiences, lots of media, scenic treatments that really bring the war to life. However, what you're going to see tonight in the Forbes Gallery, it takes a little bit of a different approach. It allows 50 artifacts and 18 interactive oral histories to really take center stage. And I think what you'll find is through these objects and these individuals, the gallery will highlight some of the most unique experiences of the war, and I think really shed a new light on some of its most iconic moments. At the heart of all of these items and these stories is a personal story about what it took to win the war. I know we have a number of the artifact donors uh, with us here tonight, and I'd like to recognize them. Please stand our way for donating these items to make this important gallery possible. Thank you. I know it's a, it's a privilege for us and that you have placed the trust in us to take care of these items, and it's a privilege that we now have a wonderful place to display these important objects. And I think we think this is just the beginning. Um, we have, what, 300,000 artifacts in our collection. We have 50 in the Forbes Gallery. So we may rotate out a few every now and again. We have great material here. Um, we'll continue to share uh, new artifacts that tell new stories in the future as well. But in addition to these artifacts, our collection also contains 12,000 personal accounts that are integrated into our exhibits, our educational programs, and all of our outreach efforts. And as you will see, the Forbes Gallery takes our oral history program to new heights with Voices from the Front Interactive, which uses artificial intelligence to allow our visitors to carry on authentic conversations with members of the World War II generation for now and many years to come. And this is where I want to take a moment to extend my deep gratitude to our museum trustee that I mentioned previously, Sandy Villery and its late wife, Margie, for providing the generous support to make this possible. Now, many of you know Sandy. He's been in New Orleans for a minute. He's sixth generation New Orleanian. Um, he's proud, I think, to preserve his family's legacy through his support of our mission. And Sandy and his family like the Forbes family, have been advocates for this work for a long, long time. In fact, going back to before the doors even opened, and he would tell me that when he would spend some time on the coast in Bay St. Louis, he would often start his Saturday mornings off with a conversation with Dr. Ambrose at the coffee shop. So you've been a part of this mission for a long time. You've served on our investment committee since we formed the endowment 18 years ago and in 2021 became a trustee of the museum. And it was in 2021 when we had a gentleman here in our exhibit, Alan Moskin, an interactive oral history. Uh, he was a liberator of a concentration camp. And we were all just amazed at how our visitors were taken by the conversation that they were able to have with Alan. Now, this was in the dog days of COVID. This was when we didn't have two nickels to rub together. But when we saw the power that this had to connect with our visitors, we said we must go out and collect these stories from World War II veterans and bring this to the museum permanently. And I remember we went up to the second floor, Sandy, you and the other Sandy. You saw the impact that that Alan Melskin story had. And without hesitation, you said, I'm all in, we're gonna make this happen. 
without your support, sir, we would not have been able to have done this. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So a few more thank yous here, and we'll get to the program. I also want to thank James Fong and Cole Kawana, who are with us tonight, and the StoryFile team who have pioneered this technology to make this possible. Gentlemen, please stand and be recognized. You all are doing amazing work. Thank you. These, these were rigorous interviews, several days long, over a thousand questions in a purpose-built studio, um, and the work that you're doing is just transformational, not only for us, uh, but for all kinds of organizations, so thank you. And I also want to thank Frank and Sashi Kawana and the Japanese American National Museum, as well as the Zakar Foundation and the Zakar Holocaust and Remembrance Foundation for making the interviews of Lawson Sakai and Ben Lesser available so that we can include their stories in this exhibition as well. So please give them a round of applause. So in just one moment, we're going to begin tonight's panel, um, but I want to close here before I introduce uh, Aaron by thanking the team here at the museum, the, the wonderful staff, the wonderful volunteers uh, who make this museum a special place uh, every single day. Uh, and a few people in particular who have worked uh, on this exhibit. Um, Aaron Clancy, our AVP of Collections and Curatorial Services. You'll hear from Aaron in a second. And her team of Kim Geis, Joey Balfour, Hannah Daly, and Tom Schertz have just done remarkable work. And I know there are many more, but thank you all very much for making this possible. So, Moderating our panel tonight is Erin Clancy. She is our Associate Vice President for Collections and Exhibits. Erin uh, has a very big job. She is responsible for the care and management of our artifacts, our archival materials, our oral histories, our digital collections, as well as for the interpretation of the collections through exhibitions. And she is going to be joined on stage tonight by Tim Forbes, Tony Silberti, and Ambassador Theodore Britton, and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about them when she gets up on the stage. So with that, please join me in welcoming Aaron, Tim, Tony, and Ambassador Britton to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. If this is, this is now on, I think we're now live. Um, after this, we'll be performing in the French Quarter, I've promised everyone. Uh, so, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and esteemed panelists. Um, as Stephen said, I am Erin Clancy, the Associate Vice President of Collections and Exhibits, and it is my great pleasure to serve as the moderator for tonight's panel discussion. Um, so our panel uh, today comprises three very distinguished individuals, each with a unique tie to this momentous occasion. First, we have Tim Forbes, the son of legendary Malcolm S. Forbes and a significant sponsor of the Forbes Rare and Iconic Artifact Gallery, as you just heard. Uh, Tim brings with him uh, not only a familial legacy, but also a deep passion for preserving history through the rare and iconic artifacts showcased in this gallery. Um, speaking of artifacts, um, joining uh, um, Mr. Forbes is Antoinette Tony Silberti, whose generous donation of a parachute wedding dress now graces the exhibits uh, of the rare and iconic gallery, which I hope you have all seen. So Tony's contribution is not merely an artifact, but a poignant reminder of the human stories that are woven into the fabric of history. Uh, last, but certainly not least, we have Ambassador Theodore Britton, 
a distinguished World War II veteran of the Monfort Point Marines. Um, Ambassador Britton's participation in the Voices from the Front interactive interview lends vital human perspective to our understanding of the wartime experience. Uh, his first-hand accounts serve as a bridge. I'm getting some feedback here. Sorry about that. Serve as a bridge connecting past sacrifices to uh, present remembrance. Uh, so today, as we celebrate the inauguration of the Malcolm S. Forbes Rare and Iconic Artifacts Gallery featuring Voices from the Front, our panelists will delve into their personal stories um, and their connections to this newest initiative at the National World War II Museum. Their stories, as you'll come to see, exemplify the enduring significance of preserving history for the many generations to come. So please uh, join me in welcoming our panelists. Okay, now for the interrogation. Um, I'm gonna start off, uh, my first question is for you, Mr. Forbes. Um, uh, would you please share with us the personal connection that your father, Malcolm Forbes, had with World War II and how that connection influenced your family's decision to sponsor the Rare and Iconic Artifacts Gallery? Well, I would uh, begin simply by uh, adding another thanks to those Stephen made, to all of you, and uh, in particular to the veterans who are here who uh, are featured in that remarkable interactive display, and to the Villary family for making that possible. Uh, as Stephen noted, my dad was, uh, was a sergeant, a machine gun sergeant uh, in the war. He enlisted as uh, Stephen noted, in 1942, mid-1942. Uh, he spent the next two years uh, training maneuvers and so on. Uh, his division, the 84th Rail Splitter Division, was ultimately deployed in uh, the early fall of 1944. Uh, they landed on Omaha Beach in uh, November early November. They were quickly uh, deployed to the front, which was then on the Belgian-German border. Uh, and they saw his uh, company, saw its first combat uh, on September 13th at, at a battle called, uh, around a little town, Prumern. Prumern, I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Uh, and uh, that battle lasted a couple of days, was a seesaw affair, and like I think many, if not most of his generation who fought in the war, he didn't really talk that much about it to uh, all of us. But I do remember, my brother Bob and sister remember, one Sunday lunch where he recounted a story of that particular battle where they had taken the town, or at least part of it, the Germans counterattacked and overran the American positions, at least where he was. And he spent the night with his uh, machine gun section hiding in a cellar and hearing the Germans around them that night. The Americans counterattacked and took the town back. But in the marginalia of the official history of that, his copy of the official history of the division, recounting the Battle of Prumer, he wrote in the margin uh, in his, uh, his red pencil, which as an editor he always uh, had, handy, uh, and just wrote in the marginalia, the worst night of my life. Uh, and we didn't come across that until literally a few months ago when that, uh, co that copy was unearthed by a, a niece, of one of our nieces. Well, two weeks later, uh, he was on a patrol uh, and came across a German patrol, and uh, the Germans shot first, as he put it, and he was uh, wounded uh, with two nine millimeter bullets in his left leg, shattered his leg. He was lucky, dragged off the battlefield. Uh, just one minor note, the uh, battle jacket there, if you look in the uh, left, no, right shoulder, you'll see a slash mark, and that's where the medic Cut, his, cut the battle jacket open to jab uh, morphine into his arm. Uh, but he was evacuated and then spent nine months 
recovering from those wounds and was ultimately discharged. So the, the point of that is really a couple fold. One, he spent roughly three years in the Army, two years of it being trained and deployed. He spent roughly three weeks in combat and then spent nine months recovering from the last night of that three weeks. Point there again being just how extraordinarily violent combat when it unfolds really, really is. Uh, and you see that uh, in the series that's on TV now, uh, uh, commemorating the Masters of the Air, and I couldn't believe when I realized that one of you would be here this evening. Extraordinary. But the violence and the toll, the pure human toll that combat takes on people is, is for those of us who have not experienced it, really quite impossible to, to imagine. Our father also had uh, a profound love of history. Uh, we were publishers of American heritage for many, many years. He, he got that across to all of us. We all have a passion for history. So uh, that's how his personal experience, but also his passion for history itself, uh, and his uh, awareness of how important it is to be informed of history, to understand the present, that when the opportunity was presented by uh, Stephen Ambrose and Nick Mueller to uh, uh, get engaged with the, with the D-Day Museum, as it was uh, characterized then, was uh, just made not only good sense, but almost an irresistible way to uh, acknowledge uh, our father, uh, but also uh, the whole generation that he was part of. So that's how Thank we you. got involved. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'll ask another question here uh, for Mrs. Silberti. Um, your parachute wedding dress holds a, a, a very unique and sentimental story. Would you mind sharing with us the emotional journey behind creating the dress from the parachute your husband brought back from World War II? Uh, and it's a two-part question. If you uh, wouldn't mind also um, telling us what motivated you to donate it to the museum so that it could be displayed here in the Rare and Iconic Artifacts Gallery. Now, I would have to begin by saying after 77 years, I finally opened the box that I had stored my wedding gown. And it just shocked me when I saw it because it was just, just the way I had packed it. Nothing happened to it. it to me, it was beautiful. And uh, I had to think of what to do with it. That was my big dilemma. I knew I couldn't give it away. I knew I couldn't just toss it. And one night, I was with some friends at a social event, and one lady, my very close friend, said, well, you know, something special you should do with that. And then um, I had a very dear friend, Frank. He said very boldly, no, that should be in the National World War II Museum. <laughs> and, And I flippantly said, oh, of course. <laughs> but see, he was serious. And he asked my permission to contact the museum. Well, to my surprise, within a day or two, I received an email saying, yes, we would very much appreciate your donation. Well, I was so relieved because I finally found a safe haven for my gown. And I knew that it would live on forever for the whole world to see. So I am profoundly, proudly humbled and honored that you took it over and you made a place for it in your museum for the whole world to see. But now the icing on the cake is that it was featured in the Forbes gallery of rare and iconic artifacts. Can you imagine that? I couldn't. <laughs> so I'm... <laughs> well, so I'm forever grateful. 
And I wish I lived in this area because I'd come down to look at it very often. <laughs> it never looked so beautiful as I saw it this, mor this morning. I peeked in at it. I, I'm just thrilled. And I want everybody else to see that too. Well, thank you. I, you're welcome to come anytime to visit the dress. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that it looked as lovely as it does now at least one other time oh, <laughs> the day that you beautiful. wore it. And um, yeah. I have a garter that goes with that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's on the behind the scenes tour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it was very special. One other, just a, an anecdotal, you, this, this, this donation also happened at the height of the pandemic, if I recall correctly, and it was a very unusual and unprecedented time for us, and I remember we conducted the, uh, the sort of the, the, the discussion about it over Zoom, which was brand new at the time. That was, a, that was something that stood out to me, so it was very oh. special in many ways. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. That's <laughs> nice to know. Right. Um, well, thank you so much, and I have now a question for Ambassador Britton. Uh, so, Ambassador Britton, as a Monfort Point Marine veteran, your experiences are invaluable. Uh, how does it feel to be a part of the Voices from the Front interactive interview in the gallery here, and, um, and allow, which allows visitors to engage in conversations with you uh, and other veterans uh, through artificial intelligence, which is also a you know, new emerging um, technology. Thank you for that very complex question. <laughs> Sorry, yes, uh, they are. I had, to, I had to pack as much in as I could. <laughs> I, I have to be a coward. My wife is sitting over there. Vernell, please stand so the folks can see you. I have to go home and eat every night. <laughs> and, and at the age of 98, at the age of 98, I better get something good, otherwise I'm not going to be around very long. But, but thank you. And, and Dr. Watson, thank you very much for having me down here again. And finally, to Steve, you and your family. I'm a banking and finance major, so, you know, not that we have anything in common except that we both love the same commodity. But thank you very much. I was a little disappointed when I heard it was odd and unusual artifacts and what have you. I, I didn't know what to expect. But there was one thing that I experienced in World War II that I really was looking forward to. There was a soldier who was going around every day, and every time he saw a piece of paper on the ground, he'd pick it up and look at it read it and he'd say, no, that's not it, and he'd throw it down. And finally one day they decided that maybe he wasn't quite, you know, he wasn't quite there, so they brought him into the psychiatric ward and after examining him, they decided that maybe he should be discharged. So they came out and handed him this piece of paper and he looked at it and he said, that's it, that's it. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know what to expect, I, I, I'm grateful for what, we, what you did put up, but I was looking around for that piece of paper. Anyway, thank you very much, but I have a number of things to say, and, and I apologize, Erin, if I took a little bit longer, but, you know, when you're older, you, you want to get it all out before you go. I'm still at room temperature, which is, which is good. But listen, I have a philosophy. One is, too soon we get old, and too late smart. And so once I learned that many, many years ago, I tried to beat the clock. I'm still fighting it, but if I try to learn as much as I can, and by the same token, to share it. My life is dedicated to helping people. The other one is equal opportunity means equal responsibility. I'm not talking about <laughs> I'm not talking about civil rights. I'm talking about all of us. If you don't believe it, wait till April 15th come. <laughs> but again, we all have a responsibility to each other. I like the way Lester Holt says it at the end of his program, and at night news program. He says, let us take care of yourself and each other. So that, anyway, let me get to it. Um, these sayings apply to every American, especially in an area uh, uh, that I've served as your ambassador. When I was at, introduced at a certain ship, a nuclear-powered vessel in Barbados where I was serving as ambassador, and the 
Boatsman announced at the top of the gangplank, now coming aboard, United States of America. Just think of what this did to me, being, being born in South Carolina, where the only direction I knew in life was up. And here it is, someone calling me. But it made me responsible, feel responsible to all of you, all of you, all of you. And so my life is dedicated to helping you to be better Americans and to be just good Americans. But anyway, <laughs> we lost 85 million people in World War II, upwards of 85 million people in World War II. Too bad that we have to do it. Now, I have this Congressional Gold Medal, and it says some, for something like, for outstanding perseverance and courage that inspired social change in the Marine Corps. I'm glad that it doesn't say for killing so many people, Japanese or German, because I've traveled 173 countries or so, and I've gotten to know people in all of these countries. All of them were wonderful people. Sometimes, because of differences, we feel that the only way to settle them is through arms. Steve, I'm glad you have the museum going, that you're educating people and so forth. You're getting the message out to everybody. There are better ways of solving our problems without killing each other. And so I'm just happy to, to, that you are doing it. I spent a goodly amount of time up there at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because that was the basis of our war. I mean, the Japanese may have had reasons which they felt very serious about. The Germans had reasons and so forth, and the Americans had reasons. There were 40 countries, all with different reasons. The mere fact that we've gone from 51 signatories to the United Nations to 193 now says that there was over 150 people, nations out there waiting to be born. And that's what came out of it. But anyway, Aaron asked me about Montford Point. It's called Montford Point because that was the only base in the piece of land that had been purchased by the United States government in 1940. And this before Camp Lejeune started, but we were sent to this camp as a segregated camp, obviously. The Marine Corps had excluded African Americans for 150 years. And even when the president signed Executive Order 8802, the Commandant of the Marine Corps said, given a choice of 5,000 whites or 250,000 blacks, he would take the 5,000 whites. I forgive him, he was using the extent of his intelligence and his humanity at that time. But he could have sunk us in the soup. The other thing, of course, is out of it, so many of our guys, African Americans, fired expert rifle range on the, on the rifle, expert on the rifle range. They were good shooters, very good. And yet they had to supply ammunition and food to our white colleagues who didn't even qualify on the rifle range. So in a sense, our leaders of the Marine Corps were sending young white men to their deaths while keeping in the back of the line black guys who should have been up front doing the firing. But too soon we get old and too late smart. My service in the Marine Corps was one of education. I learned an awful lot. I served in Guadalcanal and Solomon Islands and also in Hawaii. And I read as much as I could about life, about history. I even watched the formation of the United Nations and so forth. So I came away a much better person than I went into the Marine Corps. But in addition, I learned that because I had survived, that I owed a duty to the rest of those who didn't survive. I used to think that if, nine, if a thousand of us went into battle and 999 were not coming back, 
I would feel sorry for the other 999 because I knew I was coming back. The fact that I am here today said that I was blessed in the sense of being saved and I still have a duty to help out every people. So Montfort Point was an interesting thing. It was a new experience. I recognize that the men did not always know the right things or the things that were beneficial to us. Even just the other day, I discovered that a certain document, 19, uh, called uh, document 321, specifically stated in 1943, a year before I came in the Marine Corps, that no black man would ever be superior to a white man in the Marine Corps. Now, I had a first sergeant who had an IQ of 165. That's Mensa territory. But he never got to be an officer. But I go back to it. The Marine Corps was a very enlightening experience. Many of our fellows came from the South where they had to walk across the street in the South where many of the white folks would come across them. They had to speak very low. They had to bow their heads and so forth. In the Marine Corps, you were taught to look a person in the eye, speak directly so that you could be heard a block away, and also that you stood up. This was not the same persons that came out of the South. We think of the civil rights thing as being so much of the marching and so forth, and I respect all of that. But when you take 20,000 men out of the South and train them to look a person in the eye and speak up, not only that, that you can take a rifle apart and put it back together again blindfolded, you're a different kind of an American. The Marine Corps helped to make better Americans as far as I'm concerned, and we're profiting from it today. So, I... <laughs> So true. So true. So I hope that I answered maybe a little bit too long, but I, <laughs> thank you. Well, I, um, I'm going to go off script and say these are the, this, I imagine, you know, um, generations from now, uh, children, a child being able to listen to that story that you just told, and they wouldn't, be they, they wouldn't believe it otherwise, other than hearing it from you, and thank that you. it was your experience. I think it's remarkable. So thank you. Thank you. But um, uh, we will, I'll move on, and I, and I will say, fair to say, perhaps, that we're entering the lightning round of this, because we're, um, we are a little over time, but, but um, I'm joking about that. Please, uh, please take your time. Um, so I'm going to go back to you, Mr. Forbes. Um, sponsoring a permanent exhibit requires a, a really deep commitment. I think that's an understatement. Um, what inspired you to take on this role, um, and what message or narrative do you hope that this rare and iconic artifact gallery will convey to visitors about the impact of World War II uh, and your father's dedication to preserving its memory? Well, we got involved, as I alluded to, because uh, Stephen Ambrose was persuasive and Nick was persuasive, <laughs> but also because, uh, as I also alluded to, the mission of the D-Day Museum originally was this, I think was born of the idea that Stephen had that his oral histories, which informed all of his books and his research, needed a place to be showcased, preserved and showcased. And that intersection of the person, we've heard some, there are many others uh, in, the, uh, in the exhibit, this intersection of the personal with vast historical forces uh, uh, is, is the fabric of history. It's what makes history uh, uh, alive. It's also that notion that you're, you can't choose your context, but you get to make and mold what comes out of that context as an individual. And that's a tremendously powerful and appealing idea and is baked into every element of this institution today. Uh, I can't believe that the, the exhibit that forms the core of the gallery, the, the AI exhibit, I, 
that takes it to a level, as Stephen said, that it would have been unimaginable to Stephen Ambrose. And uh, really, the idea that we can go back in 25 years and ask Ambassador Britton questions about his experience in the Marine Corps roughly then, 100 years before, is just not marvelous. And people will take away from that and from the museum as a whole. That sense that while history, again, you don't choose the context, history has its own uh, flow and force. Individuals are who are making it and living it every day. Thank you. Thank you. I could not agree more. Thank you. Next question is for Mrs. Silberti. Uh, so donating such a personal and cherished item must have been a really significant and difficult decision. Um, you've told us a little bit about it, about finding it. Uh, but um, my question for you is, what do you hope visitors will take away from seeing your wedding dress here in the museum? And, um, and how does uh, your dress honor not just your story, but the experiences of countless others uh, during that era? Well, first of all, I'd like people to notice that it is a nylon parachute wedding gown. Remember, parachutes were designed to save a human life. And of course, the nylon fabric, it, to me, expressed strength and power. And that's what I hope they see. The cording of the parachute was made to form and shape the parachute. Well, we took the cording and we braided the cording and set it around the neckline for the same reason, to keep the bodice together. And then we took the hem and the train and wound it around the cording for stability. And that's what I want people to see. That's the way we looked at it. And that's what I hope that they can see. And now, after that, I want my gown to speak to all women of that era for their untold stories. And there's many. And I wish I could hear them all. Uh, actually, you know, my speaking the way I am about my gown, what I feel is incidental compared to what my husband endured during the war. I mean, being shot down and not and surviving, uh, being lost in the jungle, on, doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with, with Japanese soldiers. Well, I see all of that in my gown. And that's why I always thought that it was a unique item and it was showed the history of World War II. I could see all that in my wedding gown. Uh, but I would like to portray that to everyone. So if they're like me, when I see something in a museum, I put myself in that person's shoes or in that situation, and I try to visualize how I would feel and what I would do. And that's what I hope the future generation um, can see and understand. I know the seniors will know what I'm talking about. That's, that's beautiful. I, I thank you so much. And I, um, and I think that's, that's why, that's the power of personal uh, artifacts like this, that they can mean so much. It's one, one thing can mean so much. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, Ambassador Britton, I'll ask you another question here, um, and it's again uh, about this this new this new technology uh, using artificial intelligence and machine learning to capture and share your stories. It's a it's a unique approach. I think that's putting it mildly. It's um, I can't imagine um, you know we ever would have thought we would we would be we would be here doing this, um, you know. Um, but um, I'm going to ask you, how do you believe this technology enhances the museum experience and 
ensures that voices of World War II veterans like you um, continue to resonate with audiences, especially, um, I'm especially interested in young generations. Well, the use of this AI and mechanical techno machine technology is gonna help future visitors to better understand what was going on at all levels of the war effort. And I'll tell you about them. But you know, I can't resist the fact that we have in this group a man who has served as a 19-year-old Tuskegee Airman escorting planes over Germany in World War II, and as a 70-year-old airman in Vietnam in 1970, in 1960, in the late 1960s. Walter, Lieutenant Colonel Walter Cottage, please stand up and let him see you. You talk about a veteran, this is a veteran. <laughs> but anyway, I get back to it. You know, after the war, we heard many stories about what was done. And by the way, we would see lots of pictures of dear old General MacArthur treading through the water and what have you, I shall return. And I'm not gonna tell that joke, by the way. Um, <laughs> and at the same time, we'd hear about President Eisenhower coming fo later following the men across the um, channel into France and what have you. But we never get the stories of those men who were at the very bottom of the things had to work from the ground up. I used to be a little bit, a little bit mis uh, mis uh, mis sort of guided about my experiences because I was a company clerk until I realized that MacArthur and Eisenhower were doing the same kind of work that I was doing, except they had a bigger office. <laughs> I never saw pictures of them on the battlefront with a rifle firing at the enemy, neither did I. But again, when they talked to the men, and so many of them out there who were right at the grunt things, like my friend there from, who landed at Utah Beach, and others who landed in different places, and they would be asked the questions. They were answering the questions on the video that were posed to them by the one, two, three, four, and five star generals after World War II was ended. Because these men, great as they were, never saw what it was to be up front, to be attacked by the enemy, to be fighting for their lives, to suffer the wounds as Tim's father did, because they were, they were not there. I'm not saying that these were necessarily negative or bad or anything, but for the people who come into the video, into the studio now, the gallery, the Forbes Gallery, and talk to people and ask them questions, veterans who were there, they're gonna get the straight story directly from what happened. To be, to have to go without food for days or something, or to be out in the cold without anything to keep them warm or something, or to have to run for their lives or something. These are all stories that you don't read in the newspapers, you don't read in the books and what have you, but these are the stories that come up. The other day I stopped at the, um, Sky Club, and I happened to talk with one of the gentlemen who was taking care of the place, and he said, oh, he said, you're a veteran. I said, yes, and he said, my father was a veteran, so I said, well, what, what was he, what did he do, and where did he serve? And he said, I don't know. He never told me. I do know that he had three bronze stars, three bronze stars, but he never told me how he won them, or, or what they were given to him for. Well. I do an awful lot of reading, and I know that there were documents out there that said, under no conditions shall black men be looked upon as good and sufficient warriors. It's one, Army War College number 197-25. Oh, it denigrated us so much. So no matter what you did, it was not going to be recognized, but here was a man who has three bronze stars 
and his children don't know what he did to earn them. This is what your legacy is going to do, Tim, because there are people who can look up these things and not only tell the children, but also to tell the rest of the country what these men did, because many of them came back to the prejudices, the suffering, the discrimination, and so forth, but still, they served as a, this, this cap says the right to fight. Doesn't it seem crazy that we had to fight to get in to the defend our country? But yet, that's, that's what it was all about. The legacy that we're doing on these videos will tell them what happened. Not necessarily the negative things, but the good things, because out of it came so many good things. Um, that we have experienced as an ambassador traveling for the United States. I traveled a lot in Africa, among other places. When World War ended, World War II ended, there were three African countries. Today, there are 54. Where did they come from? They came about because we fought a war. And these are things that as I say, come out in the course of talking about it. So this is, thank you very much for the question. And by the same token, it, I want to thank my fellow veterans for spending their time. Even though it's, we've gotten older and so forth, we came forward to share our stories. And these stories will be shared with people in the future. Hopefully, the young folks will get a better understanding of what it was all about and help them as they deal with future problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. I have one more question for each of you. Um, and I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Forbes. Uh, in, and it's the, the last questions are, are primarily addressing the legacy uh, uh, here. So uh, in what ways uh, do you believe the gallery contributes to educating and engaging future generations um, about the history of World War II? Um, and the people, including your father, who played a role in shaping uh, what came after the post-war era. Well, there's a very famous well-known quote from Faulkner uh, that says, the past is never dead, it is not even over. Uh, that's the essence of it, that we're all part of the uh, fabric of history that this generation of which our father was part and you gentlemen here tonight are still of, uh, they not only defeated the monsters of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, they also stared down the uh, monstrous regime of, Soviet, of the Soviet Union. Uh, they uh, participated in and helped uh, create a fairer and better America. Uh, they, the civil rights movement and so on. They improved the world. It's not perfect, their legacy, of course. But they left and are leaving uh, a better United States and a better world than the one that they came into. So as people, as kids and so on, anybody comes through these exhibits, it's not only what they did there, but also it's a, there's a challenge to that. It's not just learning something about the past. It's a challenge. What are you doing? What are you going to do to uh, make the world a, a better place as these people of that generation did before you? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for you, Mrs. Silberti, the, the rare and iconic artifact gallery is, um, is it's, it aims to preserve and showcase the items that are both historical and emotional. They have, uh, they have impact in both of those, uh, in both of those ways. Uh, what message or legacy do you hope your wedding dress will impart to visitors, especially regarding all of the things that you mentioned before, resilience, strength, love, the human stories that are intertwined with the wartime experience. Well, my, my uh, story is 
I've heard so many other stories. The women, uh, my, my story, I feel, is so insignificant to, to whatever else took place in the World War II that both gentlemen have described. But my personal feeling is that I always remember, I feel as if I'm a living window into the history of the World War II era. I lived through all of that. And I just like people to, the younger generation to know that no matter what happens, you just persevere, you just keep going. I remember my first great big disappointment was when I was 17 graduating from high school. Well, guess what? We were all there, dressed in our gowns, but there was nobody to dance with. All the boys were gone off into the service. And so, but we learned to carry on. I mean, I remember keeping aluminum foil of all things, new and used or scraps, and we'd wash them and roll them into the ball. And in your social gathering, we saw who could make the same, same and make the largest ball of aluminum. And that was all for the war effort. And we did things like that, and there was a lot of shortages. I remember being in line for gasoline for an hour at an end and getting to the pump, and the pump is empty. And so I just like to think, these little things like that mean nothing today. I mean, you know, if you don't have gas, well, you just go to another gas station, right? So I think I, the message I would like to put out there is that I feel if you keep trying everything in your daily life, whether it, you have a shortage of anything, you just keep going and some idea will come to mind as to overcome what, what you, you know, are missing. But as I said, I feel my story is so insignificant to everything that I've heard today. But you know, that's all part of history. Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't mean to, uh, to contradict, but I think your story is very significant and, <laughs> and, um, and seldom told, I think, the, the stories of the families. Um, I, I think it, it's an incredible story and, need, and deserves to be to be highlighted. Thank you, thank you. Um, and my, my final question is for you, Mr. Uh, uh, Ambassador Britton. Um, so preserving the stories of veterans is a vital part of historical education. Um, in your view, uh, how can initiatives like Voices from the Front contribute to a more uh, comprehensive understanding of history and the diverse experiences of those who served? Um, and why is it important uh, for future generations to hear it firsthand? I, I, I think it's important that it's firsthand. Well, let me start by saying that one question that was not asked to me, and it's going to be asked by young folks in the future, is in during World War II, we saw a lot of folks involved in fighting the war or doing different things in the war. but. Although we had the postal unit in the army, we never see any pictures of any women, black women Marines in World War II. And the reason is because although the Marines were finally forced to accept black men in 1942, it wasn't until 1949 that it was compelled to accept black women in the Marine Corps. And they were a neglected group, and sometimes I feel a little bit badly when they talk about what we Montfort Pointers did, knowing full well that thousands and thousands of good, tough, hard women, black women who could fire expert on the rifle range, were not allowed to serve their country by serving in the Marine Corps. And so we owe them a little deference, or at least to acknowledgement. And this is part of the continuing education that we need to do, because as 
Constitution says, or the preamble says, towards a more perfect union, not a perfect union, but a more perfect union. We never stop, and we still need to acknowledge those women. But in total, this is going to help young people in the future because they're going to be asking more and more questions. And Steve, I'm so happy that you have this kind of forum going, that you can talk. When I was growing up, museums were places, you remember the word muse, where you tip quietly through through the museum and you look at things and you keep going and finally out. Look at this crowd. <laughs> look at them. Coming out, cheering, and and just being together and learning about this is, is something that sets forth for the future. And we're gonna have a better country because of the young people posing these questions. And I just hope that everybody can step forward and be prepared to answer them without any shame, without any apologies or anything for what we didn't do right, but rather that we're doing a darn sight better today. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's all I have to Thank say. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so uh, I, I, I think we're a little bit over the time that we um, that we had allotted. So we're going to um, to keep the question and answer portion to the to the after party, if that's okay with everyone. And I will um, I will sum up the uh, the discussion we've had here tonight um, and and uh, take the opportunity to to thank each of you for your um, you know your really wonderful, insightful, meaningful responses to these uh, multi-part questions. <laughs> but thank you so much for, for everything that you've, uh, you've given us tonight. Um, Mr. Forbes, your commitment to honoring your father's legacy and your generosity have made this gallery a reality. And uh, we, I, extend uh, my deepest appreciation to you. Mrs. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Silberti, your wedding dress is more than just a donation. I hope you know. Uh, it's a testament to the power of individual stories to, to really transcend time and connect people across generations, across families, across everything. Uh, so thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Ambassador Britton, your service and sacrifice during World War II uh, and after World War II, in fact, they're an inspiration to all of us uh, here today. Um, your participation in Voices from the Front ensures that your experiences will educate and inspire future generations as well. So thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Very, very And uh, to the audience, thank you so much for your engagement and for your presence here today. It's through your continued support that our institution can fulfill its mission of honoring the past, educating the present, and inspiring the future. So thank you very, very much. And um, please feel free to, um, to, to squeeze into the gallery. It's maybe you won't all fit, but I please, uh, I hope that you will um, enjoy the exhibits there and come back again and again. And, and I hope that you wouldn't mind staying around if there are, if there are some questions from the audience. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.